Okay, this is the chapter on temperature relations, which I think is some stuff that's really fun and really interesting. So right here I have a uh, thermal image of some penguins, and uh, you can see the areas of their bodies which are um, giving off heat on their face, and those that are conserving heat where they're covered with, their very, with very thick um, feathers around the core of their body. You can see their feet are also giving off heat as well. So there are some adaptations that they have for dealing with, conserving, and even giving off heat. So temperature is a measurement of kinetic energy or how fast molecules are moving. Um, and it's generally referred to as heat. And like I said, uh, animals have evolved different ways to regulate their internal temperature, whether it be uh, behavioral, behaviorally going into a cooler or warmer area, different parts of their morphology. Um, they may be going through some chemical reactions with, on the inside of their um, bodies to internally regulate their temperature, etc. So some of the things we see here, structurally, these, um, these uh, flowers um, reflect sunlight to the interior of their flower and that attracts insects there. Um, and those insects can then um, um, are attracted there and then will help to pollinate the flower. So we've talked about m macro climates and how those uh, weather patterns or over a long period of time which are predictable um, affect the structure of a landscape of an area which we call biomes, right? Um, but microclimates are also very important and that is looking at these uh, effects of temperature on a smaller scale. So looking as small as a kilometer even down to like very centimeter. And just looking at a um, landscape such as this mountain, you know that not all parts of it are going to equally have the same temperature spread. And so uh, there are different things that affect that, including the altitude, so how, um, well actually the elevation would be a more correct term. Uh, the elevation up and down a mountain, but also I guess up and down in the atmosphere, the altitude um, is different. You may also have um, <clears throat> aspect or the slope of an area will deflect sunlight or capture sunlight in different ways. Um, vegetation, the different color of the vegetation, different type of vegetation, whether it provides shading or um, may deflect heat elsewhere. Um, that is important. Um, the color of the plant or the color of the substrate even will absorb or reflect heat in different ways. The topography, so whether there are burrows or boulders or um, other things causing shade. Um, and then the effects of water. So water has a high um, specific heat. It absorbs heat readily and holds that heat for a longer period of time than air or um, rocks or other things. So one of the things that was tested experimentally was uh, an organism's ability to adapt to a different temperature. And uh, what was found was this principle of allocation, where when you um, took an organism, um, let's say fruit flies, and you took a, took a small population of them and you started raising them at a lower temperature, over many generations they would become adapted and selected for that lower temperature. But when you put it back in a higher temperature, it would show a decrease in its ability to um, survive and reproduce. So a species that is adapted to a specific environmental condition is less fit at a different environmental condition. Uh, condition. That is what the principle of allocation basically is. Um, so uh, with that allocation, uh, species then are more, most efficient at a narrow range of temperatures. So within that narrow range of temperatures, 
their enzymes work best, whatever the heat transfer is needed, um, and all the metabolic processes are going to use energy the most efficiently. Beyond that, you're going to um, have problems with um, proteins and enzymes and other things just don't work properly, or not as efficiently at least. And so the meta, meta, <laughs> metabolic, metabolic, metabolizable energy intake, or the MEI, um, is a function of the energy consumed, the energy lost in the feces, and the energy lost in the urine. So the amount of energy um, within an organism is proportional to how much um, energy it is, uh, is consuming through its food but you lose some of that energy in the form of urine and feces. Um, photosynthesis is another thing, of course, that affects temperature and performance of organisms. And photosynthesis occurs best at a maximum rate within a narrow range of temperatures. Um, and that's what this figure then shows. You have two different um, organisms that photosynthesize here, a desert shrub and a boreal moss. And a boreal moss, of course, is going to be in the boreal forest. It's going to do better at a lower temperature because that those environments are, have lower temperatures. Whereas in the desert, which has higher temperatures, um, its maximum rate of photosynthesis was at 44 degrees Celsius. Now there is some fluctuation in these temperate areas, so um, there uh, organisms will acclimate or make physiological adjustments in the short term um, to adjust that efficiency. So one of the things an organism is going to have to learn how to do, especially in a fluctuating temperatures, is regulate its body temperature when, when the temperature changes. And so um, the total or H sub S heat stored in the body of an organism is a function of a number of things, including the metabolic heat it produces, plus or minus the heat that is lost or gained via conduction, via convection, or via radiation. Those are the three forms of heat transfer. And then um, heat is also lost when things evaporate. So um, you have to subtract heat loss through evaporation in the total heat stored in an organism. And you can see that in this figure here, the different ways that heat is transferred. Um, and gained or lost. So uh, animals have different ways of thermoregulating. Not all animals have all of these things important to them, um, depending on their environment, their structure, and other things. Um, so animals do different things to vary their temperature. Um, and there are different uh, depending on their environments and how they do that, there are different categories. So one of them is called a poikilotherm, where their body temperature changes with their surrounding environment. They do not regulate their temperature at all. The only mammal that is known to do that is this guy over here called the naked mole rat. And the reason why it does that is because it lives in these burrows which have a very constant temperature. And so it's lost its ability to regulate its temperature. You have ectotherms, which rely um, on external sources to change their body temperature. And so that would be like this dragonfly or this fish, which is, um, yeah, then, or another example would be most reptiles, which will bask in the sun to get warm and maybe go into a burrow to get cool. Or a fish might swim up and down in the water column, depending on the different temperatures. And then you have endotherms, which rely on their metabolic activity internally, you know, the, the chemical reactions going on inside their bodies to regulate their temperature. And so that would be like this bear here and um, this camel as well. Now, some organisms have a very narrow range of body temperatures. Humans would be um, included in that. The bear would be included in that. And some have uh, an ability to maintain a fluctuating range of temperatures. And um, a camel, in comparison, can actually lower its, uh, its body temperature and raise its body temperature 
much higher and lower than other mammals. And the reason for that is it lives in the desert, which gets very hot in the daytime and very cool in comparison at night because there's nothing around there to trap the heat. Plants um, have different ways of um, maintaining their temperature. Uh, desert plants usually have leaves high off the ground to avoid gaining heat from the ground. Um, they use wind for cooling, for taking away the heat, and then usually their leaves are a color that reflects heat. So that way they can avoid conduction, convection, and radiation. Arctic and alpine plants are then going to do the opposite though. They want to bundle together, still close together, so they can kind of maintain heat. Um, they're going to be light and hug the ground for, for um, or to, to, yeah, to decrease the cooling effect of wind um, and increase warming from the substrate from the ground. There are very few plants that are actually thermogenic, so through their metabolic activity they can actually increase um, their temperature. Um, and that includes the skunk cabbage, and these are actually able to melt snow around them um, in order to break through the snow so they can access the air. Ectotherms uh, generally bask in the sunlight to um, get warm. Some of them will cool in burrows or in the shade, um, and some of them might cool in the water. Um, and they may have, also like plants, different colors to uh, absorb or reflect um, sunlight as well. So an example of that is from a book is from these grasshoppers. Um, grasshoppers that were reared at a low temperature, they developed a dark pigmentation so they could absorb more heat, more heat while those were at a high, that were raised at a high temperature had a light pigmentation so they could reflect um, sunlight. Um, as mentioned before, endotherms uh, have are generally homeotherms, but not all of them, and they maintain what's called a thermal neutral zone. And this is um, the range of temperatures over which their metabolic activity um, doesn't change. So where they don't have to spend any energy warming up, and they don't have to spend energy energy cooling off. So basically, that perfect temperature. So for humans, it's like 72 degrees Fahrenheit. But above or below that, and you have to do some things in order to um, to maintain a stable body temperature. Um, so those things might include insulative layers like um, fur or hair or blubber, or the size or shape of the organism. All of these things will affect the thermal neutral zone. Beyond that, if the temperature is too low, um, endotherms will shiver. This will increase metabol mu muscle activity, which will have the side effect of increasing the heat. It may also burn fat, especially brown fat, which has lots of mitochondria in it, so lots of energy can be used to make heat. At high temperatures, they may sweat, so taking advantage of evaporative cooling, or some uh, Endotherms don't have sweat pores, so instead they pant or breathe out of their mouth, um, and they'll get evaporative cooling off of the tongue and mouth. And then some, such as this free-tailed bat, will radiate heat from blood vessels. You can see it has this nice blood vessel down the side of it, so that when it's flying, um, it, that air it creates will also help cool it, uh, help cool that blood. Aquatic organisms have to deal with um, maintaining their temperature differently because they're in water, which sucks the heat out of organisms. So um, one of the ways that they do that is first they are air breathing. So you know fish and sharks and other things, um, they have gills where they have to run the water across their gills, um, and that constantly exposes them to that cold water. But uh, being air breathers, they can go up to the surface, take a few gulps of air, and then go back down. And so the exposure time to the water is a lot less, and the exposure area is a lot less as well. Um, a lot of times they will have thick insulated 
layers, especially in Arctic oceans as well. Um, and, and they mostly keep their blood um, on the internal um, part of their bodies or the, you know, the larger part, that way they can maintain heat better that way. But um, to their appendages, what they have is a countercurrent heat exchange system where the cool blood, which is coming back from the flippers, is warmed by the warm blood, which is coming from the central body core. And when you run those in a, in a cross current um, way past each other, they will exchange heat, and that just makes things more efficient. They can also um, use their muscle activity to raise their body temperature. Even things like bluefin tuna will do this. They can swim very fast, use their muscles a lot, and increase their body temperature. So another problem organisms have is during extreme temperatures, how are they going to survive? A lot of them will enter a resting stage. And this may be on the scale of days, where they would just you know sleep, find a cool place at night if it's too hot or a warm place, and may reduce their metabolic rate. Um, reducing your metabolic rate can, um, yeah, the general term for that is torpor, so a state of reducing your metabolic rate and body temperature, so you are um, using less energy. Usually this happens when it's cold, but not necessarily. So hibernation then is a type of torpor that lasts for months over the winter season and estivation is a state of torpor that lasts for months over the summer season. Um, hummingbirds are a good example of, um, they have to expend a lot of energy um, going from all these uh, different flowers and then just their ability to hover requires a lot of energy. So if nectar is scarce, they will go into a state of torpor and decrease their body temperature significantly. So it doesn't use as much energy. But if they have plenty, then they will go around uh, with a higher temperature and uh, will be able to collect more nectar. All right, so two um, observable phenomena which relate to this temperature are, uh, one of them is called Allen's rule and the other one's Bergman's rule. Allen's rule, if the way to remember this is Allen's is appendages. Okay, so animals that enter in a hot climate will have large appendages for radiating heat. So you can see that in these hairs. These are all of the same genus, lepus. Um, and those desert ones have very big ears, and what that allows uh, their blood to do is to go to the ears and release heat. Very large appendages as well for releasing heat. Um, but animals that are in cold environments will have very small, so you can see on this end they have smaller ears and smaller appendages for retaining that heat, keeping things close to their body, huddling up into this ball form so that they can stay warm even when it's cold. Bergman's rule has to do with body size. And Bergman's rule states that in a species who's, that inhabit you know, um, a wide range of temperatures or a wide range of climates, those that are more polar will have a larger body size than individuals that are more equatorial because of the temperature. So if you live in a colder place, you're more likely going to be larger. And you can see this in moose. Um, if you've ever seen a moose, you know, um, down in Minnesota or down in the Rocky Mountains even, they're a lot smaller when you compare them to those of northern Canada or Alaska. All right, that's it for temperature relations. We will have another exciting lecture later.